In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Let us read some verses from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, starting from verse 5. Jonah 3, starting from verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Glory to the Holy Trinity, now and forever and unto the age of ages. Amen. Tomorrow, God willing, we will fast the fast of uh, Jonah. It is three days in commemoration of the three days that Jonah spent in the belly of the whale, which are symbols of the three days the Lord spent in the tomb before his resurrection. And I'm sure all of you know the story of Nineveh and Jonah. Nineveh was a great city, but full of sin, full of iniquity. They turned against God. And God, who desires not the death of a man, but rather that he returns and lives, asked Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach them and give them warning. If they don't repent, God will destroy the city in 40 days. Jonah, for some reason, didn't want to go to Nineveh. Maybe he knew that God is compassionate and merciful and he will forgive them and the city will not be burned or destroyed. And thus, as a prophet, he told them something would happen and did not happen. This actually may harm his credibility as a prophet. Also, Jonah knew very well from the Holy Spirit in him and the prophecies that the acceptance of the Gentiles will be in the same time rejection of the Jews, which happened with the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Gentiles who were not Jewish became Christian and most of the Jews still do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So maybe Jonah thought that if Nineveh believed in God, this means rejection of the Jews. Maybe that's why he did not go. And he decided to take a ship and to run away from God. But you cannot run away from God. 
You cannot run away from God. So there was a big storm happened. And they tried to manage the ship. The sailors tried to manage the ship, but they couldn't. So they knew that this storm is not a normal one. So they start to ask, who is behind this storm? Why this storm is happening to us? Jonah told them, I am. I am the one. I'm running away from God. And I tell you, if you throw me in the sea, the storm will calm down. They tried and tried to save Jonah's life, but they couldn't because the storm actually was very severe. So at the end, they threw him in the sea and the storm calmed down. But God actually did not allow Jonah to die. He sent him a huge whale to swallow him. And many people cast doubts on this story. But there are scientific evidences to prove that a huge whale can swallow a man and the man can remain alive. Actually, they call, John, they call this person Jonah of the 19th century. In the early years of the 19th century, a whale swallowed somebody and this person remained in the whale belly for some time like Jonah, and then the whale spat him, and he was alive. But it is not the time right now to discuss all the scientific evidence that this story is a real story. Then Jonah prayed a very beautiful prayer inside the whale, and God allowed the will to spell him uh, on the seashore. Then Jonah went to Nineveh and preached them. And the whole city repented. And the part that we read today is about the repentance of the people in Nineveh. This passage, the repentance of the Ninevites, is a very important passage. Do you know why? Because the Lord said about these people, the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament, that the people of Nineveh will stand in the day of judgment and they will judge this generation, the generation of our Lord Jesus Christ, as well as our generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And he told them, and now you have a greater than Jonah, but you did not repent. Now we have Jesus Christ. We have his teaching. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the communion with God the Father. And unfortunately, some of us did not repent like the people of Nineveh. That's why I like to discuss in detail the, peop the repentance of the Ninevites and to take their repentance as example for us to follow if we want to repent. Because this is the model that the Lord Jesus Christ said, the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah, and they will stand in the day of judgment and condemn that generation because they did not repent at the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which means the repentance doesn't uh, depend on which church you are going, which priest or bishop you are listening to. Repentance is the decision in your heart. There is no comparison between Jonah and Christ. People of Nineveh repented when they heard Jonah. 
And the generation at the time of Jesus Christ, they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the creator of Jonah. So don't say, I'm not repenting because we don't have a strong church, we don't have a strong abuna, we don't have a strong bishop. Don't say this. This excuses. Repentance rely on you. Repentance is, in Greek, is metanoia. Sometimes we pronounce it metania. And metanoia is two Greek words. Meta, which means change. Noia means nous, mind. So metanoia is the renewal of your mind. It's the change in your mind. Because your mind, your belief system, will determine your action. Repentance starts in your mind first. When you make this decision to have the mind of Christ, that's how repentance starts. And this is what St. Paul said in Romans 12. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Renewal of your mind, that's repentance. And when I repent, I will be transformed. Transform it to what image? To the image of Jesus Christ. To that image, the image of Jesus Christ. So let us analyze the repentance of the Nevites from the passage that we read, Jonah chapter 3, starting from verse 5. The first element in their repentance, so the people of Nineveh believed God believed God. When Jonah told them, your city will be turned down in 40 days, they believed God. If they did not believe God, they wouldn't repent. If they did not take Jonah serious, they would not repent. Maybe most of us will say, thank God, the first element of repentance we have it all. All of us, we believe in God. And we believe that his words are the truth. But let me challenge this. You read in the scripture, like in the book of Revelation, that liars will not enter into the kingdom of God. Liars will not enter into the kingdom of God. Do we believe this? If we believe this, why some of us until now, we lie and we justify this lying? Do you take these verses seriously or not? You read in the Sermon on the Mountain, whoever says to his brother, foolish one, is worthy of the fire of hell. We still curse one another. And we still badmouth each other. Do we believe God? Do we believe that lying and swearing and cursing will not get us to heaven? If you believe God, you will repent. Many times we say we, we believe him, but in reality we don't. We don't take these verses seriously. What about what the world now is trying to convince us that is normal and acceptable? like homosexuality and transgenderism and abortion, same-sex marriage. Unfortunately, many people who claim to be Christian, they believe what the world is saying and they call God a liar. By believing what the world is saying, 
you are calling God a liar. You, are, you don't believe God. There is no repentance here. Do we believe God or not? God said, don't judge lest you be judged. Matthew chapter 7. But we still judge one another until now. So that's the first element. The second element in their repentance, they proclaimed a fast. So the people of Nineveh believed God, first element. Number two, they proclaimed a fast. Tomorrow, actually, we'll start the fast of Jonah. It's only three days, so maybe most of us will keep this fast, or all of us. But the challenge after two weeks will start the Holy Great Fast for 55 days. And here, some of us will say, oh, 55 days, that's too long. No, no, I just, I will fast for one month, or two weeks, or 10 days. But fasting was an essential element in their repentance. Why? Number one, the Lord said about Satan and all the soldiers, this kind cannot come out by anything except by prayer and fasting. Repentance means you are rebelling against Satan. That's repentance. You are in a spiritual warfare against Satan. Nobody goes to a war not armed. If you are going to a war, you need to be armed. But our weapons are not carnal. Our weapons are spiritual weapons. And two important weapons in our spiritual warfare with Satan is fasting and prayer. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He told us this kind, Satan, cannot come out by anything except by prayer and fasting. How you are going to repent while you are dismissing something very important like fasting? Fasting will help you to gain self-control. You see food that you like, but you say, no, I'm not going to eat from it. Why? Because I am fasting. So you are training yourself to say no to your own desires. So when Satan is tempting you by any sin, you will be able to say no. I will not do it because I am fasting. You will be able to say no to the temptation of the world and of Satan. Also, fasting will discipline your flesh. And while you are nurturing your spirit with prayer, so your spirit will be strong and your flesh will be disciplined. In this way, your spirit can control your flesh. St. Paul said the carnal people are controlled by the desires of their flesh. But the spiritual people are controlled by the spirit. If your spirit is strong, your spirit will control your body. But if your spirit is weak, and your body is strong because you fulfill all the desires of the body, then you will be a carnal person against repentance. St. Paul said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest after I preach it other, I myself 
become disqualified. People will say, but why you fast too many fast, long days of fast? Why? Because we need it. We need it. We are in, 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 in lockdown and taking all these precautions for almost one year right now. Why? We need it. And this is a very important tool and weapon in your spiritual warfare. We need it. That's why we need to fast. The third element in, uh, in their repentance and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Putting on sackcloth meaning they humbled themselves before God. Repentance, we are asking the mercies of God to come upon us. We're asking God to have mercy upon us, to send his grace to support us, to forgive our sins. You never ask for a favor in a prideful and arrogant way. When you ask a favor, you present it usually in a humble and meek way. So we need to humble ourselves before God. Time of fasting is time of exercising humbleness. Maybe literally will not put on sackcloth, but will say with David in Psalm 50, to you only I have sinned and done evil before you. I have sinned, I have sinned. Lord, forgive me. For there is no a servant without sin and no master without forgiveness. They humbled themselves before God. There's uh, six, fourth element in their uh, repentance. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. So we see here even the king humbled himself. He did not sit on his throne. He took off his royal garments. He covered himself with sackcloth and sat on ashes. S sitting on ashes also is a reminder of uh, the fire of hell. And also is indication of uh, humbleness before God. In the Catholic Church, the first day of fasting is Wednesday. Not like we, we the Coptic Orthodox Church, first day is Monday. So they call it Ash Wednesday. And the day before it, in which they actually uh, get ready for uh, fasting, it is called Fat Tuesday. In French, call it Mardi Gras. The world prepares themselves to fasting in the wrong way. It's called Fat, fat Tuesday because they eat whatever they want to eat. And unfortunately, Mardi Gras now is one of the worst celebration in cities like New Orleans. And I don't think that is the right way to prepare yourself for fasting. But let's go to Ash Wednesday. And in the Catholic Church, they go to the church on the first day of the fast, 
and the priest anoints their forehead with ashes to remind them that this time is a time of repentance, returning back to God, humbling ourselves. And remember that people who refuse to repent will not be saved. As I told you, it is a reminder of the fire of hell. So this tradition uh, in the Catholic Church was taken from the uh, book of Nineveh, how people during the time of fasting, they put on sackcloth and sat on ashes. Then the king, verse 7, and he, the king, caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Don't let them eat or drink water. And this actually is the fourth element in their repentance. First, they believed God. Number two, proclaimed a fast. Number three, humbled themselves. Number four, what I will call it communal fast. He, he, he made a decree that everyone fast together. They were Gentiles, so they don't have enough spiritual knowledge, but even they made the animals fast with them. Of course, there is no fasting for animals, but according to their own knowledge. But the first point is the communal fasting. We need when we pray together, we support one another. In the same way, when we fast together, we support one another. People will say, we will fast in our own time. That's good, but this should not replace the communal fast. Because when we fast together, our fasting will be very, very strong, like the fasting of the Ninevites, they were able to change God's decision to destroy the city. If I decided not to fast, I'm not only hurting myself, but also I am weakening your fasting. That's why it's important that all of us we fast together. We are one body. Can you imagine your body not in harmony with each other? For example, if your two eyes are not in harmony with each other, you will see double vision. In the same way as one church, one body, the body of Christ, we need to be fasting together. You cannot choose to fast and somebody else not to fast. Then the fifth element in their repentance, verse 8, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Cry mightily to God. So the fifth element is prayer. As I told you, the Lord said, fasting and prayer will cast out demons. Why? Prayer is the nourishment to your spirit. Fasting is discipline to your body. St. Paul in Galatians said, the spirit wars against the body, and the body wars against the spirit. So there is a war between the body and the spirit. In order to make your spirit win, win the war, you need actually to feed your spirit. And what is the food of the spirit? Prayer. And prayer, actually, I like how he said it here, cry mightly to God. 
Cry is not screaming, but cry, it is your heart is crying to God. Can you imagine if you are in a danger? For example, a person is drowning or in a fire. How he will ask for a help? He will be crying. In the same way, repentance is asking help from God in my spiritual warfare against the devil. So we need to pray. Fasting is not only changing your food to eat vegan instead of just regular food. No. Fasting is to cry to God and to pray. If you don't pray at all, you need to start praying. And if you are praying, you need to increase your prayers. If you are praying twice a day, make them three or four times a day. And in your prayer, focus on the quality. It will not only just words coming out of your mouth, but coming from your heart. In Jewel, the Lord said, on the mouth of the prophet Jewel, tear your hearts, not your clothes. Tear your hearts, not your clothes. That's repentance. Prayer is important because you cannot get the grace of God except through prayer. So we said they believed God, proclaimed the fast, put on sackcloth, all of them fasted together, and then they cried mightily to God. Number six, yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Repentance as if you are making you turn. Repentance, instead of giving your back to God and you are walking in the way of the world, you are making you turn and returning back to God. That's exactly what he meant. Let everyone turn from his evil way. If I am lying, I need to start saying the truth. If I'm cursing, I need to start saying words of blessing. If I am dishonest, I need to be honest. That's actually repentance. Putting off the old man with all his evil deeds and putting on the new man. In uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 4, St. Paul gives us example how to turn uh, away from your evil ways, starting from verse 25. He said, Therefore, putting away lying, that's what you put away. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Be angry. It's okay to be frustrated or upset, but do not sin. Don't, during your anger, don't hurt people around you or disobey God. Don't sin. And do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Then he said something about stealing. Very beautiful. Let him who stole steal no longer. But what, what's here to put on? He said, rather let him, the thief, to labor, working with his hand what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. So it's not only enough not to steal, but also you need to work hard 
not only to provide for yourselves, but also to give others who are in need. When I stole, I took something that's not mine. Now it is time in repentance to give those from what is mine, those who are in need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. That's what you need to put off. But what is good for necessary edification? What comes from your mouth is only what's good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you and with all malice. You need to put off all these things and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgive you. That's repentance. Repentance, as I told you, is like making you turn, putting off something and putting on something else. We need actually to ask the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts. Maybe tonight, before you sleep, spend 10, 15 minutes in prayer and then write down what I need to put off and what I need to put on as exercise. So before we start fasting, you know exactly what are the things that you will put off and what are the things that you will put on. And number seven, the last point actually in the repentance, who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Hope and confidence. If these people did not have hope that God may forgive them, they wouldn't do all this. I remember I said to one of the youth who was struggling with a certain sin for a long time. And he was about to give up on himself. I told him, I am not concerned about you regarding this sin, but I'm more concerned regarding the despair, the spirit of hopelessness. As long as we have hope and confidence, we'll start fighting. And since we are fighting, we will win through the grace of God. Don't let Satan install the spirit of hopelessness in you. Don't say, I have been fighting this sin for so many years. I don't think that I will ever overcome it. No, these thoughts are from Satan. Satan has three titles. The deceiver, the tempter, the accuser. These are titles in the scripture. These three titles are very important because they explain to us the technique that Satan is using. The first step, deceiving, deception. Deceiving means he will let you believe a lie. That's deceiving. He will let you believe that sin is good, there is pleasure, there is joy, there is happiness in, in sin. It's not big deal. He will let you believe that you can sin and you will not die, as he said to uh, Eve. You shall surely not die. Once Satan make you believe that sin is good, Number two, the second title, temptation, tempter. He will tempt you. Tempting you means he will make the sin pleasurable and easy to access. 
Ask anyone who is drug addict right now about the first drug he took. It was for free. Someone gave it to him. He did not pay for it. Same applies for drinking, same applies for um, smoking. That's temptation. And now Satan is making sin very, very accept, uh, accessible. On our phones, you know, gambling, you can gamble on your phone, you can watch pornography on your phone. So sin is very accessible. It's tempting us. Sin, actually, I said a few days ago to, to some people, I think we are now in a society in which we are breathing sin. Evil is around us everywhere. Everywhere you turn your eye here or there, here, you listen here or there, you find something ungodly around you. Temptation. Then after you commit the sin, because you are deceived and you are tempted, then accusation. Sin will accuse you. We read in the book of Revelation, he is accusing us day and night. And part of his accusation, he will tell you, it's a lost case. There is no hope. Exactly, he used these three steps with Judas. Tempted him with money, uh, deceived him. It's okay to betray the Lord. Nothing wrong with this. It's a win-win situation. You will betray the Lord. You will get the money. But the Lord, he delivered himself several times before from the hand of the Jews. So the Lord will deliver himself. So here, you will get the money, and the Lord will deliver himself. That's why Judas, when he saw the Lord was condemned, he started to feel guilty. That's part of the accusation. And then he tempted him. He made a deal with the high priest to give him money. And after deceiving him and tempting him, he started to accuse him. I have sinned, there is no hope in me, and he went and killed himself. So hope is a very important element in our repentance. So these are the seven elements in the repentance of the Nevites. They believed God, proclaimed a fast, humbled themselves before God, they fasted together communal fast as a community. They cried mightily to God. They repented and turned from their evil way and from the violence in their hand. And they had hope and confidence that God would forgive them. What was the result? Verse 10, then God saw their works. God saw these seven points that I mentioned. And that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. And God forgave them. Not only forgave them, they became actually a model to us. The Lord used them as a role model and said the men of Ninevites, the, the men of Nineveh, will stand, will rise in the day of judgment and condemn this generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now there is greater than Jonah. So while we are starting fasting tomorrow, I hope we put these seven points in front of our eyes and we follow them that God actually may accept our repentance and grant us the eternal life and eternal salvation. The book of Jonah is four chapters. It's a very small book. And the fast is three days. And Thursday, we call it the Feast of Jonah. And it has a special reading uh, for the Feast of Jonah. So I hope that during this fast, you can read every day chapter. And on Thursday, you read the fourth chapter. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you can read in these four days the four chapters. Of course, you can read the whole book in one session. It's so small. 
But I want you to read and to reflect on it. Not just to read it. Take some time, take 10 to 15 minutes and, and try to reflect. You know, like what we did today, we took six verses and we reflected on these six verses. Try to live with Jonah, to live with the Ninevites, try to live with the sailors, identify with them and see if you are in their place, what would you do? That's how we do reflection and meditation. And this will be a good preparation for the Holy Great Fast that will start, God willing, after two weeks. May the Lord accept our fasting and our prayer through the prayer of St. Mary, St. Mark, and Prophet Jonah. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, on God, amen. Our dear Lord, we give thanks to you, we praise you, we glorify you for all the blessings that you granted us. We praise you for the Eucharist this morning, for the assembly and fellowship with one another for being with us and blessing us. We praise you and glorify you for your words that's written by the Holy S Spirit in the scripture to enlighten us and to guide us in our journey in this world. We ask you to give us a spirit of repentance because without you we cannot repent. You give us your grace to follow the footsteps of the Ninevites and to offer you acceptable repentance and fasting and prayer. We ask you to be with us and forgive us our sins and to write our names in the book of life. Bless this church, Abuna, the deacons, the servants, everyone in this church with your heavenly blessings. Guard them and protect them from all evil and all temptation. And hear us through the intercession of St. Mary, Mother of God, St. Mark the Evangelist, and the Prophet Jonah. Hear us who now pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen.